Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. I'm Louis Fremkes. And before I introduce the speaker, I should mention that uh, next month we will have Ann Patchett. And the following month in May, I've invited uh, Maza Majist, the Ethiopian writer who was shortlisted for the Booker Prize to, to speak. Uh, in addition, during the week, if you go to our website, uh, you can access our video archive. But tonight is very special. And as you know, Jane Smiley is one of America's great writers. Uh, she's a great stylist and a great equinophile. Uh, she's the author of numerous novels, including Pulitzer Prize winning A Thousand Acres, which she was telling me earlier was made into a film, which unfortunately I missed. Um, and uh, last hundred years, the recent trilogy, which, which received the Heartland Prize. She has also won the Penn Center Lifetime Achievement for Literature. Tonight, she will talk about her interesting and eventful life in letters and tell you a little about uh, some of the interesting things that none of us know that have occurred to her in that literary life. And at some point, I'm hoping towards the end, she will uh, also mention Perestroika and Paris, her new novel. But before Jane begins to speak, you should know that she would like to proceed in the following manner. She is going to tell you a little about herself. Then she's going to pause and take some questions from the audience, from you. Down at the bottom of the screen, you will see a box. And while she is speaking, you may enter questions in that box so that after she's speaking for a while, when she turns to you for questions, they will be there. Then she will speak again and then more questions and so forth and so on. That said, I'm gonna turn it over to Jane. Jane Smiley, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, and you know, I'm not gonna wait until the end. I'm at least gonna show the cover of Perestroika in Paris, known if there are any European people who are listening as the strays of Paris, that's the English edition. Um, and that is my latest book. Oddly enough, um, it was published pretty much exactly 40 years after my first book, which was called, um, oh, I can't, can't even remember, Barn Blind, which also contained a lot of horses in it. So the thing I wanna talk about today is um, the, my own idiosyncrasies. I'll talk about those for about 10 minutes. And then after the first set of questions, I'll talk about the world of publishing that I came into um, and how that supported me. And then I'll take some more questions. And then I will talk about what I see happening in the literary world now as the literary world changes. So first I'm gonna talk about my own idiosyncrasies. Um, I grew up reading a lot of books. I went to uh, a good high school and my parents allowed me to go for two weeks to London in the it, spring vacation of my senior year. And when I came home from my senior paper, I wrote about all the things we've done in London and I really enjoyed it. And I had visited some fun things, some fun places like 22 Baker Street, you know, um, because I'd grown up loving Sherlock Holmes, especially the Hound of the Baskervilles. And I really, really, really wanted the Hound of the Baskervilles to appear in my backyard, but unfortunately he never did. Anyway, I got more and more interested in writing in college and I took creative writing courses and I turned in my papers and I, I don't remember that I knew what I was doing, but I do remember that um, during my, my senior year, I was sitting by the Christmas tree and I was reading Our Mutual Friend and I read it all night 
I thought it was the most interesting book I'd ever read. I'd read plenty of Dickens. And I remember looking around at the Christmas tree and the room and the quiet and thinking, yeah, 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 I really, really, really want to do this. And so at the end of my senior year, um, I decided I was gonna dedicate myself to learning how to write, but I had no subject. My own family was fun, but it wasn't interesting. Nothing, nothing weird that we knew of had happened in our family. Um, they're your basic middle-class to lower middle-class family in, in St. Louis, Missouri, which seemed boring to me. So I looked around at my fellow students and my friends, and I pondered what the things that they were going through that they had told me about. And I decided secretly to write about them. And so my first, uh, the first things that I wrote about were about relationships that I didn't know anything about, but I had to make up stuff in order to try to understand those relationships. After my senior year in college, my, uh, I was then married and my, my husband and I had, could not find any jobs. And I had some money from um, the War Orphans Act. And so, and it was just enough. And so we decided to go hitchhike around Europe for a year. And we left in June first place we went was the UK. And the first thing we did, since he was a medieval history major in college, was to do, to work on an archaeological dig in Winchester, uh, outside, just outside of Winchester Cathedral in Southern Illinois. And I found that hitchhiking around, so we went to England, then France, then Italy, then Greece, then Crete, then up through the Balkans and back across Europe, back to France, back to England, and then back to the States. And we, we saw all different kinds of things. We saw beautiful, beautiful cathedrals. We saw beautiful palaces. We saw the Lipizzaners, but we also saw extremely dramatic events, like at it being at a youth hostel and um, watching one of the fellow youth hostel uh, inhabitants uh, suddenly collapse. And then the, the ambulance came and these, this guy had to be carried out on a stretcher. And, and I think that was a very great stimulant for me because we were on our own um, nobody was telling us what to do, and we were exploring, and I got that feeling in my mind of what it means to explore and how interesting it is. And the whole time we were in Europe and exploring, in my journal, I, my, my husband carried my typewriter, which was a tiny little typewriter, and I kept writing, and I also wrote about my writing in my journal. So exploring and writing were the same thing as far as I was concerned. Um, we came back, uh, I, applied, I applied for, I, I don't know what's going on, but there's some kind of music that's interfering. I applied um, for admission to the University of Iowa to the writer's workshop. I did not get in. He applied for admission to the history program. He did get in. So we moved to Iowa City and he started uh, in his program. And one of the things that I did was I went to a party uh, and there was a medieval literature teacher who, who taught old, old Norse, <clears throat> taught old Norse. And I talked my way into his class just to sit in on his class. He let me do that. I did all my homework. I kept up with what we were supposed to do. And then I got admitted to the English department. 
And I really was lucky in that way because I loved Old Norse. I loved all the old English languages that they were teaching there. And I took classes in all of them, including Old High German, um, uh, Gothic. I don't even remember all the names of the classes, but the one that really stuck with me was Old Norse. We read pretty much, uh, well, we read some of the sagas uh, in, the, in the original, and then I read the rest of them in translation. And then I heard about Greenland, about the Norse colony on the southern, on the eastern, excuse me, the western side of Greenland. And I thought that was so fascinating. And so I planned to write a novel about the end of that Norse colony. I did finally get into the writer's workshop. And one of the interesting things about the writer's workshop was that my, my, their, my classmates were all about my age and it was about half women and half, half men. And they were very welcoming and kind to one another. And one of the things that we did, if we didn't like our workshop, was that we would have our own little um, readings and critical meetings to see what each other thought. We didn't, we didn't really care what our teachers thought. We cared what the others thought. And I love that. Um, I stuck around the University of Iowa to continue in Old Norse. And maybe the best thing that happened to me and the luckiest thing that happened was that publishing began to open up to women editors. And my best friend at the writer's workshop decided that she wanted to be an editor and she wanted to go into publishing. And she was slightly ahead of me in class in terms of when she was going to graduate. And so she left for New York. She got a job in publishing. And, and since publishing was evolving, it was no longer the books by Norman Mailer or Saul Bellow that were the only ones they were interested in. Um, the most idiosyncratic thing that happened to me I kept going on in graduate school. I kept studying Old Norse. I kept um, paying attention and I made a plan that someday I was going to write this novel about Greenland, but I needed to practice first. And so I considered all the novels that I wrote before the Greenlanders, let's say Barn Blind at Paradise Gate, uh, Duplicate Keys especially, and some of the others as practice novels, because I really only cared to, a whole lot about the Greenlanders. In the meantime, my friend who had left uh, to go into publishing, she became an assistant editor for a pretty powerful um, senior editor. And he, he turned to her one day and said that he had decided to take Freudian uh, psychotherapy every day, five days a week to deal with his problems. And therefore, since he didn't have all that much time, she was allowed to buy any book that she wanted. She just couldn't pay a whole lot for it. And so when I had finished Barn Blind, by this time I was married and I was pregnant, um, I said, I'll send this to her and I sent it to her and she bought it, even though she was only an assistant editor. And he fulfilled his promise and let her publish it. Now, the next great thing that happened was that when Barn Blind came out, nobody paid any attention to it. That meant that I could, I could, enjoy the publishing process. I could get a small amount of money. There might've been one or two reviews, I don't even remember, but I could get a small amount of money and I didn't have to deal with any kind of um, publicity. I didn't have to deal with any kind of pressure. I only could just, I just had to do what I wanted. So 
the next book I wrote was at Paradise Gate, which was kind of about my family. Um, same thing happened. It was, it got published, but not during this, not during the fall when the most important books get published. So once again, it was a practice, <coughs> a practice novel. Um, all during this time, I was living in Iowa. I had a child and then another child. And the best thing was that there was daycare. Um, in Iowa City, I hired somebody who came for uh, two hours a day. She watched the babies while I did some writing, uh, but I could only afford two hours a day, but that was good because that got me into the habit of using my two hours a day and then getting back to whatever other things I was supposed to do. Excuse me. <coughs> so I'll say one last thing. After I finished from the University of, of Iowa, I'm sorry. <coughs> I'm sorry, I, lots of allergens in the air. After I finished at the University of Iowa, I went to get a job. Um, I went to one of those conventions, you know, that they held for job interviews. And I had my baby with me after the interview. And um, I was walking down the down the the hall, and I saw one of the interviewers coming toward me, and I saw him look my look at look me in the face and recognize me. Then I saw him look at the baby, then I saw him look at me in the face again and sort of scowl, and I knew that that was that job was off no matter what, because I had a baby. But the best thing that happened to me was that I got hired at Iowa State University. Iowa State had a lot of wonderful things, including um, a uh, child development school. So there were plenty, plenty of daycare, affordable housing, and it was a land grant university. So a lot of things were going on there. A lot of things happened there. It was full, I, was, I loved the ideas that I got just from walking around the campus. And I also loved being somewhere in the middle of Iowa rather than being in New York and having to deal with um, the literary scene because I got to be um, independent. And my editor liked my independence and that was that. For, that was a really good way to start out. Um, okay, so I don't see any questions um, in the chat area, and so there are no questions so far. Nope. Okay. Um, the next the next part of the talk will be about what happened when I became. famous when I became awarded for my work. Um, I was still in Iowa. I was still teaching at Iowa State. Um, the reviews, for the first book of mine that got any attention was um, The Age of Grief which was a novella along with a couple of short stories. And The Age of Grief was about a dentist and his wife, who was also a dentist. And, they, and he realizes that she's having an affair. And so he avoids talking about it so that she won't tell him about it. And this idea came to me because I was at the dentist in Ames and I came out of down the hall and I looked into the other dentist's office and I saw that she was wearing high heels. And I could not believe 
that a dentist would wear high heels. But my dentist saw me looking at her and he said, oh, you know, the guy she's working on, that's a local farmer and all of his teeth were hurting. So he decided to pull them himself with the pliers. And, and then he had to come in here so that she could take out all of the fragments that got left behind. And I thought, wow, dentists, dentists, they must lead, lead much more interesting lives than I ever thought. And that fascinated me. And so I wrote The Secret Lives of Dentists. And no, excuse me, that was the name of the movie that was made of it. So I wrote The Age of Grief. And it, it made me be much more curious about things that I saw around me. In the meantime, I was writing The Greenlanders and um, I was writing other things. I, I've always liked to do more, more than one project at one time. Um, after the Greenlanders, and the Greenlanders got some good press. Uh, and there were many people that were sort of impressed, uh, some other people who liked it. So I knew that I was pretty much on my way. I was now, it was 1988 when that came out. Um, so I was now almost 40. Um, my writing career in my 30s had been exactly what I wanted. Um, lots of practice, some acknowledgement, a little tiny bit of fame, and, the, and my advances getting slightly bigger, bit by bit. I still enjoyed being at Iowa State. I still thought it was a very uh, informative place to be. So the next thing, after I finished the Greenlanders, I was up in, up in uh, Northern Iowa. We were coming home from Minneapolis down the I-35. And I was driving uh, along and it was sort of late in the afternoon, maybe it was kind of gloomy. I was looking around and I said to my husband, you know, this is where I should set that King Lear book. And I thought, yes, King Lear, King Lear on the farm. And I called my agent and I said, you know, I think I want my next book to be that, that book about that rewrites King Lear because Bill Shakespeare did it so I could do it. So I, I've got permission from him and I'm gonna set it on a farm. And she said, a farm? Nobody wants to read about farms. I said, well, I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. Now, the reason I wanted to rewrite King Lear was that all through school, all through college, all through graduate school, we had read King Lear many times. And I was always annoyed, partly because Lear himself never shut up. He always talked and talked and talked about all the things that were, you know, people were doing to him. And, um, and, but the other thing was that Goneril and Reagan didn't just get to say what their point of view was. They didn't get to say why they wanted to do what they wanted to do. And I wanted to give them um, a voice. And so I did, uh, <clears throat> Ginny and Rose are characters, the characters based on Goneril and Reagan. I enjoyed writing it. It was not like the other books because I had to follow the plot of Lear um, as closely as I could without there being a war, which I didn't think was likely in Iowa. So I figured it would be legal stuff. And at one point I veered away from the plot and I had to go back and rewrite that part. <clears throat> but <clears throat> it was like a puzzle trying to stick with Lear, trying to do what the follow what the play did and yet make it agricultural, make the characters believable. Now, this was in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, and there had been a big crisis um, in farming in the 80s. 
because of various issues. But the issue that I was most interested in was the issue of pesticides um, going into the water supply and affecting the people who lived on the farm. I thought that was an, a very important issue. Um, and so I wrote a thousand acres. I then, uh, it was then published and I, I figured it would do okay. I, I didn't know, I didn't know if my agent was right or not, whether it would, you know, be a success or whether everybody would say a farm, nobody, I'm not ever gonna read anything about a farm. But, you know, but because it was based on King Lear, it got a little bit of a bump. And, um, and it, did, it did pretty well. And it wasn't until, I guess I didn't really understand how well it was doing until uh, six months after it was published when I was sitting in my kitchen and the phone rang and I, I picked up the phone and the, the um, person on the other line said, hi, I'm calling from um, the Ames register and I'm curious to know, as Ames, Iowa is where Iowa State was. He said, I'm curious to know if you've heard anything you know, from New York. I said, well, I'm working on a book review with somebody at the New York Times. He said, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I mean, have you heard anything important from New York? I said, I don't know. Okay, he said, all right, try this. Is there any way that you have heard that you won the Pulitzer Prize? I said, not at all. And he said, okay, if you had won the Pulitzer Prize, what would you have to say about it? So I said something. And then my daughter who was 14 at the time was sitting, she must've been home from school sick or something. And, she was sitting at the kitchen table and I turned around and I said, honey, I think I won the Pulitzer Prize. And she said, hmm, as if to say, so what? Which is what 14 year olds always do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so then I went to work and I went and taught my classes and I was sitting in my office. And back in those days, um, all the news went out over the wires at three o'clock Eastern time, <clears throat> two o'clock. Midwestern time. And all of a sudden the phone in my office started ringing off the hook. And then I heard running down the, um, um, down the aisle and I opened the door and it was this, the Des Moines Register Stringer who had a, a, um, a copy of the, of the Ames Tribune in her hand. And at the moment I opened the door, she stopped and she said, oh, and she'd, <laughs> she'd been scooped by the guy who had called me from the Ames Tribune. So anyway, it was, it was fun, but I was pregnant. And so I wasn't going to go on any trips or anything like that. And, and then my advances, and now we're getting to the point of publishing. So because I won the Pulitzer and because some of the other books had done pretty well, my advances got really big and I was able to do basically anything I wanted to do. And so I wrote um, the all true travels about uh, the all true travels and adventures of Liddy Newton. I wrote Moo. I wrote Horse <laughs> Heaven. I, I wanted to try all kinds of styles. Once I had gotten rid of my obsession with um, the Norse sagas, which was my epic. Once I had done the uh, A Thousand Acres, which was my tragedy, I wanted to try other forms too, because in some ways, Shakespeare was still my model. Shakespeare was the guy who would do anything. Shakespeare was the guy who would go look for material and then make it work. So I wrote Moo, which was my comedy. I wrote The All True Travels and Adventures of Liddy Newton, which was my romance, because romances are about travel. They aren't necessarily about love, or at least traditionally that's true. Um, and then I wrote Horse Heaven, which 
was a combination of all three, but all four, excuse me, but set at the racetrack. There was Epic Steam. Uh, he was the Epic horse. So they all, there were several horses who represented, six horses who represented all kinds of literary forms. Um, and then I, and then I figured I could write whatever I, I could still or whatever I was curious about, I could write about it. Um, so one time I was in Hollywood and I was looking out the window at a party and I saw stuff over in the hall, buildings over in the Hollywood Hills. And I thought, oh, those are interesting buildings. And so I wrote 10 Days in the Hills because I'd been reading Boccaccio and I figured the Decameron needed to be updated. Now, I, I see I only have a few minutes left. So one of the things that I've done my whole life is, um, or not my whole life, but much of my writing life is teaching, uh, teaching creative writing students. And the thing that I've noticed in the last 20 years, in the last 15 years, is how, once again, as always, the literary world is changing. What my students aspire to do is changing. The forms that, um, that my students can write in, those are also changing. Screenwriters used to write screenplays. Now they write um, a series of, of TV scripts for streaming. Um, they use, people used to want to write novels that were realistic. Now they want to write novels that are fantasy or sci-fi. Fantasy and sci-fi and realism come and go. So we've been in a period of realism. Now we're getting into a period of fantasy. So what I tell my students if they want to keep at it is that they need to be aware of the market, but they also need to be aware of what they're curious about, what, what they like, what they want to do. And they have to say, okay, I'm going to hope for the best, but I'm going to follow my own instincts and I am going to do what I want to do and what I think I can do. The way I teach my students is that I'm not judgmental. I don't say this is a piece of crap or this is wonderful. I ask questions. I say, you know, I'm wondering about this part or I'm wondering why this guy says this or I'm wondering what this house really looks like or I'm wondering um, how deep that pond that the little boy is swimming around in is really. And, what I, and then my students uh, turn in a draft a week of their stories. We don't judge them. We only talk about what we wonder about. And my experience of this with students is that they become more and more interested in their own stories because their own stories come to seem like puzzles and they want to solve the puzzle. And I find this to be true of both graduate students and undergraduate students. So I think my, my last piece of advice is to say, or my main piece of advice is to say that you have to become interested, fascinated by your own work, not because you wanna say something, because you do, you know, we already know that, but because you wanna figure out the puzzle that the form presents. You want to figure out now. Let's get back to, as an example, let's get back to Perestroika in Paris. I came up with this idea in 2009, just on a whim. I was on the square in the Place du Trocadero, on the west side of the Seine. I just been at a at a horse place. I thought, wow, it would be so interesting if a horse escaped into Paris. The things I had to work out weren't what would the horse think. Who would go with her? Those were easy. There'd be a dog, you know, there'd be some birds. I could look around and I saw lots of ravens everywhere. I had to work, think about how to make it plausible. How to, so I said it in the late winter, 
you know, I said it through the winter when it was mostly dark and people weren't out roaming around the Champs de Mar. I had to think about how she was going to eat. So I included a, a woman who works in a bakery making pastries overnight, who is, is happy to see her and gives her food. Um, I had, to, I knew that there were, she's going, I know because I have horses, I knew she was going to leave a lot of droppings around. So I included a, a groundskeeper who knows that the Champs de Mar has originated as a training ground for the French cavalry. And he doesn't mind there being a horse. He's happy to pick up the droppings. He puts off anything having to do with, um, you know, sending her back to the racetrack or somewhere. Um, I wanted there to be a small child and I decided to make it a boy. I knew he needed a guardian, but I also didn't want his guardian to have much power over him. So I made her 96 years old. Um, but then I had to work out what her life had been like. So I guess my next thing is that, yes, it's wonderful to have an idea. Um, the only thing you have to do with that idea is to figure out how it works, how, how the pieces come together, how you can make it plausible, how you can make the reader want to keep reading, even if the things that you say are ridiculous. And my, my favorite example of that is Animal Farm by George Orwell, where the, the pigs learn to write and they learn to use forks and knives. And you know, they they learn to use their their trotters as if they're hands. Well, this is absolutely not true. Can't be done. But Orwell mentions it and then gets you, the reader, to look away from that little detail. So he's really good at making you, getting you to suspend disbelief by making the story so interesting that you want to keep going. Okay, so I'm ready for questions. Jane, shall we see if there are some questions, Claudette? Sure. Are there any questions? Hi. Yes, we have three questions right now. Um, the first one is from Gina Bareka. Um, she asks, <laughs> <laughs> she asks, Moo is one of the funniest books I've ever read and it draws blood when addressing academia. Can you tell us about it? <laughs> well, one of the things that interested me, and Gina Bareka is a friend of mine, and I did not coach her to ask this question. Um, <laughs> she, the, one of the things that I noticed about Iowa State when I was there was that they, a lot of things were invented there, including the computer, and I wrote a book about that too. And I realized that, a uh, land grant university is not an ivory tower. It's a slippery slope. Lots and lots of things start out there and then go out into the world. I really wanted to write an academic novel about that idea, not the idea of the university as an ivory tower. And so I came up with, I knew I had to include students. I knew I had to include faculty members. And then as a surprise to myself, when I set out and I was writing the rough draft and I, I set out a kind of landscape of um, the university, which wasn't Iowa State, it was just a paradig paradigmatic university. Um, I was laying out the landscape and this young boy, this young man, a college student walks by and he goes into one of the more, one of the abandoned buildings. And I hadn't intended or thought of that to begin with. And I thought, now why would he be going into that abandoned building? And then I got the idea that I was going to put a hog in that abandoned building and that there was going to be an experiment going on to see if if you let the hog eat as much as he wanted all the time, how big would he grow? And that amused me. And so I put the hog in there and then the hog and the boy began to develop as characters. 
until really I was quite fond of the hog. So the hog was pretty much my first animal character. And um, I named him Earl Butts, which was a political name because he was the one who said to farmers, I think in the uh, Nixon administration that they had to get big or get out. So I figured that was a good name for a hog. The funny thing was that a few years ago I was at Politics and Prose and this guy came up to me and said, I want to talk about Earl Butts. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, my dad is Earl Butts. And I said, oh, shit. And he said, no, my dad loved the fact that you named the hog after him. And I said, <laughs> why? And he said, because he's such a sweet hog. And I thought, oh, that's good. Uh, that's funny. Cute. Claudette? Yeah, the next question is from Lila Suna. Um, how did you come to the idea to write your book on computer discovery? Well, that would be co that's called The Man Who Invented the Computer. I really, really wanted originally to be called The, the Invention of the Computer because it was such a complex um, event. But so when I was at Iowa State, one of the things we learned about was um, John Atanasoff, who had received the patent for the invention of the computer. And he had a really interesting background. He had a really interesting career at Iowa State. And when I started, I was originally going to write about him. But then when I started researching the invention of the computer, there were so many other people who had had so many weird experiences um, who had had a hand in moving the world toward the computer by inventing various things. Um, my favorite was, oh no, I can't even say I, I had a favorite, um, but you know, it was sad about Alan Turing who was constantly bullied when he was at the Sherburn School and, and the other students would lift up the planks in the floor and, and stick him under there, you know, to bully him. Um, it was interesting about um, at Nassau's. Oh, yeah. um, it was interesting about at Nassau's background. Uh, he was in from um, Eastern Europe, and when he when his father was young. Uh, this is one of those if only if only things, but his father ran away from the village that they lived in and um, was carrying one of the children and um, and he, he got shot carrying one of the children and the father was killed, but the child, the bullet just parted the hair of the child so the child survived. And I think that child was at Nassau's father. So um, it was just one amazing thing after another. And I loved writing that book. I had to learn a lot about math since I was never a math person and some about physics, but um, it was fascinating to write. And there was plenty of material around. Who did the third question? It's from Chris Oser. Um, you have been fearless and true to yourself throughout your career, but where do you think you acquired the wisdom to know that you needed to write novels that were practiced before you write the book that quote mattered? I don't know that that was um, something I knew at the time. It was just something I was sort of grateful for because each, um, each novel, I understood that each novel had its own imperfections. And I also understood that I had to try out different types. So um, Barn Blind was my attempt at a, a family-based novel. Um, uh, duplicate Keys, I knew I had to um, learn how to make a plot if I was going to get all, all the way to the Greenlanders, which I knew would be long and difficult and, and complex. So I figured, okay, I'll write a murder mystery 
in order to learn. I grew up loving murder mysteries, especially Agatha Christie. But so I, I said, okay, I knew I have to learn how to do a plot. Murder mysteries have the most obvious plots. So I have to write a murder mystery. A friend of mine uh, had an apartment in New York. She'd let us stay there uh, a lot of times. So I thought, okay, I'll set it in New York. And um, I, I will learn how to do a plot. Now, the thing I did, since I had no experience writing murder mysteries was, I enlisted, I think it was four of my colleagues at Iowa State. And I would give them chapters of uh, duplicate keys. And they only had to, they had to read them and they only had to answer one question, which was, do you know who did it? And there was one of my fellow teachers who was the one who said yes at one point. And so I said, well, tell me about it. She told me about it. So I changed that part so that that would be erased. Um, so, you know, part of me was always a lifelong kind of, I'm curious about this. I'm curious about that. I did not come from a family life that was dramatic enough to explore, or at least I didn't think so at the time. Um, I found out later that, yeah, they've had plenty of adventures, but I was more curious about things in the outer world. And so I wanted to shape the form uh, to sort of explore some of those issues. That is Claudette. Um, we have two more questions. So the next one is from Melinda Pressler. Um, the grandmother kept her grandson captive for her own purposes. She knew she needed to plan for her grandson's future, but never did. I thought her a cruel villain in this magical story. How did you view her? I viewed her as a 96 year old woman who had had her own experiences. Um, one of the reasons I didn't think she kept him captive, I think she kept him with her. And one of the reasons, which is stated in the book, is that she remembered what it was like when she was young and children were in institutions and children were orphans on the street. She thinks he's safer with her than he would be. And she also thinks that because of her age, the authorities will take him away. He does not have the experience. She just doesn't want that to happen to him. So she ponders what to do with him, but she can't come up with a good idea. She does have a good library. He does know how to read. He does know how to do a lot of things. It's not like he's her slave. It's not like he has to do what she's telling him to do. In some sense, he lives in this, um, this sheltered area where inside that area, he's free to do what he wants. So I'm sorry that you see him as a villain, but um, I don't know what alternatives she would have. Claudette? Oh, we just got another question. Um, the next question is from Anonymous. Um, will you talk about your process? Do you dedicate a time each day to write? Do you have a space you go to? Yeah, I'm sitting in that space right now and it's a total mess. It's um, full of stacks of books and um, you know, old candy wrappers and I don't know, a lot of junk. And that's what I like. I like junk. <laughs> I like a mess. Um, I write on my laptop. I try to write in the morning. Um, I try to write about between 1,250 and 2,000 words a day, depending on where I am in the particular novel that I'm working on. I try to go, start slow and speed up. I try to know enough through research to get started and then I keep doing research. And then there's always a moment where I, it, it, everything sort of comes together and starts moving forward on its own. And that's the moment I really love the most. The part that's the hardest is figuring out how to wind it up. 
um, figuring out how to pull the plot together, figuring out how to do the ending. The ending is a kind of um, au revoir, as it were, but from the author to the reader. And it's, it's hard to say, it's hard to figure out how to say that goodbye, but you got to do it. So that, Great. is that it? Our final question um, is from another Jane. <laughs> and she asks, where did your interest in horses There were any more of those. From? I didn't think there were. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, um, but she asked, yeah, where did your interest in horses come from? I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, my theory is that we got our first television and there was Roy Rogers, you know, and Trigger and Fury and all those shows <clears throat> in the early fifties that had horses and cowboys in them. Um, another thing that happened was that on a corner on the way between my grandparents' house where I stayed during the day and my mom's apartment, uh, she worked at the local newspaper. Uh, when I was about five on the corner, they set up a pony ride, which was a little maze. And that you'd go there, they'd strap you into the saddle so you wouldn't fall off. And then they'd get the pony to trot or to just trot around the maze maybe three or four times. And then, you, then they'd take you off. And it was a great way to learn because you're going pretty fast as far as you were concerned. And that was fun. And um, I don't know, it was, I, I couldn't stop. It was fascinating to me and I still do it. I just spent two and a half hours with my horses this afternoon, scratching my head, wondering, <laughs> wondering what was going on in their minds. Um, and that's the thing that I, that finally kept me going was understanding how interesting they are, how individual they are, how you can make them your companion, or you can, <clears throat> you can screw around. And if you don't make them your companion, then you, you're, you're more at risk than if you do try to understand them and try to make them your companion. So that I think that's it. All right, Jane, I want to thank Jane for a wonderful talk. Uh, she does love horses and dogs and animals. Uh, Frida, I'm sorry you didn't mention Frida, but that's okay. Oh, uh, poor Jane. Uh, well, she's in here too. She's in here too. Great. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Thank the audience. I thank the audience for joining us. And please come in April. If you enjoyed Bel Canto, you'll enjoy um and patchett and i think you'll uh, have another wonderful time good evening <laughs>